Welcome to the Masters of Reliability webinar series, Optimizing Underground Cable Rehabilitation Options. My name is Chrissy, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. We encourage you to submit any questions that you may have into the chat, and we will address them at the end of the webinar. I will now hand it over to Wade Pfeiffer, Vice President of Sales and Marketing at Novinium, to introduce our guest speaker. Thanks, Chrissy. Hello, everyone. Proud to say that we have Darren Johnson, President and Director of the Asset Management Practice at BIS Consulting here with us today. Darren's a mechanical engineer with over 20 years of experience working with many utilities across North America, helping them justify and optimize their rehabilitation options. His cable assessments have been used to get millions of dollars of funding for cable rehabilitation for many utilities. Darren, welcome. i now turn the presentation over to you. Thanks, Wade, and thanks, everybody, uh, for taking the time to be here. I hope you'll find this um, presentation to be interesting and informative. Um, what you're looking at here is uh, a list of utilities throughout uh, North America and, and actually across the world who have used the um, economic life optimization methodology that we're going to be talking about today. We'll be discussing it specifically in the context of underground cable, and I, I show you this uh, just to make the point that this technology or this approach is is well proven and has been applied very broadly. It's not new ground that anybody is uh, would be breaking. So let's start at the very beginning and kind of frame up the problem that uh, utilities with underground cable are facing. And this is very common. And that is that large amounts of cable were installed starting maybe in the late 1960s and that the older vintages of that cable, especially the older style XLPE cable, um, is suspect. So many utilities are seeing the rate of faults increase over time and there's a concern <clears throat> that this trend will continue and will affect reliability. <clears throat> the question is, given that that's the case, now what? what? What can be done about that and what should be done about that? And that's where this cable evaluation approach that we're going to talk about comes into play. Um, the purpose of asset management is to solve this problem that virtually every utility faces. This, this is the situation, that there's a lot of information and knowledge and experience at the level of maintenance and operators and engineers. They, they understand their system very well. They know how it's performing. And they probably have a very good idea what needs to be done uh, to keep everything up on its feet. The trouble is that they have a hard time explaining the need for spending in a way that resonates with non-technical stakeholders. So there's kind of this tension between the pocket protector people on one hand and the green eye shades people on the other hand. And the purpose of asset management is to bridge this gap, to translate the technical understanding uh, at one part of the organization into a, a cost-benefit analysis that speaks to non-technical stakeholders. And that's true of the cable evaluation process that we're going to be talking about next. And we're talking about a process for evaluating a spending decision, and I want to make a what I think is a trivial point that everybody should uh, understand immediately, and that is that we're trying to choose between two options. We want to choose the one that's cheaper, that has the lowest cost or the highest benefit. And it, as a utility, we want to consider costs broadly. We want to look not only at the cost of direct dollars in and out of the uh, bank account of our utility. We want to look at all the costs that will be faced by us and by our stakeholders. So that includes things like um, outages to our customers, the, re the reliability of the system. That includes environmental effects and possible safety effects. And of course, not all of these come in dollars, and so it's sometimes difficult to decide whether a dollar of spending is worth an incremental improvement in reliability, and that is the fundamental purpose of, uh, of asset management or one of the one of the main uh, one of the main objectives of asset managers another problem that you run into though with cable is that costs aren't just coming in discrete blocks they come in streams and so uh, you may be interested in uh, evaluating one pro one program or one one option for it for addressing say a particular run of underground cable maybe you want to replace it and that would be the upper graph option A replaced immediately, in which case you have a, an upfront capital expenditure, and then streams of maintenance and risk cost associated with that cable that will increase over time. That might be one option, and that has a net present value associated with it, which of course is dominated by that 
capital cost at the beginning. I realize I'm taking everybody back to their engineering, engineering economics, but hopefully these terms will resonate. And then you may have another option with underground cable, say to rejuvenate it, maybe inject the cable, for example, in which case your capital spending comes in two chunks, one immediately followed by a stream of risk and maintenance, and then another capital intervention some point out in the future for replacement. And even though the total capital spending may be higher in this case because we have two lumps of capital that we're going to spend, because of the discounting effect, the net present value, the effect on our, our pocketbook today could be lower. And um, our intuition isn't necessarily very reliable about this. Um, it's sometimes hard to tell whether a dollar today uh, how it relates to a dollar tomorrow. So the, the point is that we need to be explicit about our assumptions and actually do the math to figure out which one of these is the better option. The other takeaway here that I think is really important to bear in mind as an asset manager is that spending money is costly and holding on to it is valuable and we should be jealous about where we spend um, money on behalf of our, of, of our rate payers. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about the fundamental question when we're looking at cable. This is something that... Uh, that asset managers face all the time, and that question is, when should I replace an aging asset? So I've got a bunch of stuff that I installed out there in my out there in my system, and it's getting older, and I know that eventually it's going to have to be replaced. The question is when. And there's a conventional approach that most utilities use. This is where they start, and that's a technical approach. They'll say something like, well, when we installed this, this asset, this underground cable or this transformer or whatever it is, when we installed it, we thought it was going to last 35 or 40 years, and it's beginning to reach that age, so it's time for us to start thinking about replacing it. And the trouble with this is that this it, technical approach doesn't consider risk in any quantitative way. It's a, it's a, like I say, it's a technical argument, and it's a qualitative argument. And the other problem is when you sit down and ask yourself, well, what exactly did I mean by the useful life of this asset when I said it was 30 or 35 or 40 years? So every asset, whether it's an underground cable or a light bulb, is going to have a survival curve that shapes something like this, that defines a fraction of the population that will remain in service as a function of the age. So for example, when the assets are zero years old, right after we first put them into service, 100% of the population will be in service. And over time, as the assets fail, the percent remaining in service will decline. So this could apply to anything. The question will just be how steep is the drop off and when does the drop off start? That'll depend. That'll depend on exactly what kind of asset we're talking about. But if we if we say okay, there's a curve like this for underground cable, and now let's look at it and ask ourselves, what's the useful life? And you could make an argument that the useful life is the median life, where half the population would still be in service, or that it's the mean life, which is a function of the area under the curve or that it's the knee of the curve when the failure rate starts to increase, or that it's some target failure rate, maybe based on a reliability standard or something like that. And if you had a fifth engineer in the room, you'd have at least five opinions about what the useful life of the asset is. And the point here, the takeaway is that the life of an asset is not a technical concept, it's an economic concept. And you should replace assets or refurbish them when the cost to do so is lower than the cost of continuing to operate them. So this is really how I believe that uh, is the correct way to look at this question about when to intervene, either to replace or to refurbish, uh, or, or when, whether to leave assets in place. And that's to recognize this, that when you're trying to make a decision about replacing an asset, you have two competing incentives that you're trying to balance. On the one hand, you'd like to postpone the year of an intervention as long as possible in order to minimize your capital spending. You'd like to keep your money in the bank, or you'd like to spend it on other projects and delay the day when you have to actually replace your aging asset as long as you can. So that's one incentive, our downward sloping capital spending curve, our capital cost curve. On the other hand, the longer you leave an asset in place, the worse its condition will be, the older it'll be, and the more likely it is to fail. And so the risk will increase as we delay intervention. So in general, there will be this U-shaped total cost curve, the life cycle cost curve, with a minimum point out there somewhere, and that minimum point says, if you replace this asset on this schedule, you'll minimize the life cycle cost of ownership. <clears throat> and again, we're talking about uh, a broad definition of cost, not just dollars in and out, but reliability and safety and all the other things that matter to us as a utility and to our ratepayers. Another important takeaway here is that it's asset specific. 
you can't say, based on an analysis like this, that underground cables have an economic life of 42 years. All you can say is that this particular cable run that serves these customers in this location, this one has a life of 42 years. But that one over there, that might be the same type of cable installed at the same time in the same condition but serves a different set of customers with a lower, uh, a lower criticality. That one has a lower risk. If it fails, the consequences aren't as high, and that means it will have a longer economic life. So it's different for every asset. Okay, let's think about what information we need to have on hand in order to do that calculation that we were just looking at. I need to know about the replacement cost or the cost of intervention for the asset, and that's that's the capital spending. And I think most utilities know that kind of information without too much effort, so I'm not going to dwell on it. But the other thing that we need to know is risk, and we need to know how risk changes over time. So that means we need some estimate of the failure probability of the asset. Generally speaking, that means for underground cable fitting some kind of a failure probability curve over our historical failure failure data. And what you're looking at here is an example of this that was done uh, for a utility in the Northwest that had actually a pretty good uh, database of failure history for their uh, underground cable system. And you can see um, the failure rates versus age, the, the dots there, and then the fitted curve. And this curve was used uh, for projecting failure probability and, and, of course, risk for this utility. And then there are, are multipliers that were used as well to differentiate among different insulation types, different sizes of cable, and specific things that <clears throat> might be known about a particular cable run. For example, if a cable has had faults in the past, uh, the perception is that that increases the likelihood it will have faults in the future. And so you can see in this table here that if a, if a cable has had past faults, a multiplier of 2.0 is applied to the projected failure probability. So this is an example of how uh, of how failure probability can be assessed. Now a lot of utilities don't have this kind of data. Uh, either their system isn't large enough or they haven't tracked it um, well enough to do a curve fit like this. And what that means is that either they can sh try to share data with other utilities or, or find some other source for industry information of which there is some, not a lot. Or um, Another approach that's very commonly used is to is to rely on a combination of subject matter expertise and whatever data is available to uh, calibrate a failure probability curve that at least will be projecting the right total number of failures to match what they've seen maybe over the last couple of years. So I don't want to give you the impression that a very detailed, um, rigorous database is required to do this kind of thing, at least to get started. You can almost always make do with whatever you have, even if even if all you have is the opinion of uh, the subject matter experts at your utility. Okay, so we know about probability of failure. And the other blade of the risk scissors, the other thing we need to know about is the consequence of failure. So this, what I'm showing you here is a cartoon to give you the idea of what we mean by consequence of failure. Of course, there's going to be some direct cost to go out and, and replace or repair a failed cable. But the bigger deal, the thing that most people are really worried about is that there are customers who will be out of service. And this is really what we're trying to avoid when we go out and proactively replace cables. So we'd like to have an idea of what is the cost of this event if it were to happen. So let's imagine we've got this feeder with some residential customers and an industrial customer attached to it. Um, in a perfect world, we'd like to go knock on the door and ask these customers, um, well, there's a chance this cable is going to fail, and you'll be out of service for maybe two hours until we can switch you back in. How much would you be willing to pay us to avoid this outage? And then uh, we'll use that money to refurbish the cable system. And so maybe your industrial customer would offer to pay $100, and the residential customers would offer to pay $5 each, and you could use that money to refurbish the cable. Well, of course, um, there's two problems with this. You'd never be able to collect the money from uh, from these ratepayers. And, and actually, you know, if you think about it, if, if somebody had knocked on your door and asked you how much would you pay, to avoid an outage, it's very difficult to come up with an answer. And that means that um, we're not going to know it based on uh, actually asking the customers. We're going to have to infer or estimate the consequences of an outage in some other way. So there are various sources of information that utilities turn to to estimate customer outage costs. I want to just emphasize um, a couple of them. One is that the, um, 
the Department of Energy performed a nationwide in the U.S. study, uh, a survey of, of utility customers, electric customers, and just consolidated them online uh, at a website called icecalculator.com. And if you go there, you can you can use that to uh, to figure out what their survey results were for what your how your customers uh, would value an outage. Some utilities have done their own surveys. You see here a screenshot of a customer survey that Pacific Gas and Electric does every couple of years to try to estimate outage costs for their customers specifically. And then many utilities have uh, a corporate risk matrix of one kind or another that gives them a way of estimating uh, what is the risk posed by changing reliability or large-scale outages to their system. And sometimes those can be used to kind of back out what is the exchange rate between, uh, say, dropping a feeder with a thousand residential customers and um, a a one million dollar cost. In other words, how, how many points is one worth and how many points is the other worth? And that gives a way of it, of inferring uh, how your own specific utility val values customer reliability. <laughs> Um, for most utilities that are starting out, especially smaller utilities that maybe don't have a lot of uh, sophisticated, you know, corporate planning methodologies at their disposal, or 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 maybe don't have a risk matrix, I really would recommend the uh, Department of Energy um, survey as a good place to start. It almost certainly wouldn't be challenged if you used that. Okay, so now um, let's talk about assessing consequences of failure. And we'll just look at a couple of scenarios here. One where we've got a, a tap. Uh, this is an underground table, cable tap that we're looking at here, and those numbers represent customers along the way. Five, you know, five customers served by each transformer along the way as we move out along our tap. And then you see there's a switch out there where uh, the, the tap can be looped if there's a fault. Well, if there's a fault in this feeder, the consequence is going to be first that all the customers on this I said feeder, but I meant the tap. If there's a fault on this tap, the first thing that happens is that all the customers on here will lose power for a couple of hours until you can do switching, and then virtually all of them will be restored. <clears throat> so we can take that scenario, that number of customers, and, and uh, our assumed duration for switching. Maybe we think it's going to take two hours, and we can calculate the cost of that using the assumptions from one of those customer surveys that we talked about before. Another scenario would be if we had a radial tap, and that's the one down below. And in this scenario, the cost would be a little bit different because instead of the customers being out of service for all of them for two hours, some of them would be out of service for much longer until we could actually get the fault repaired. So we'd be calculating, even though it's the same number of customers, the duration of the outage um, could be much longer, and so the cost would be higher. And what that means is that cables in... Uh, and radial taps are more critical. The consequences of their failure is higher, and they will have a shorter economic life than cables that are in a looped tap. Okay, so now we have the two things that we need in order to calculate risk. We have estimates of customer outage cost, and the intent here is not to for you to memorize the table or anything like that, just to show you what they oftentimes look like. There will be some measure of, of uh, dollars for um, both the SADI and the SAFI effect of an outage on residential, commercial, and industrial customers. And there'll be some number of dollars associated. Maybe it'll be per customer or maybe it'll be per kilowatt for their average load. But a, a standard set of assumptions that you'll use for quantifying the cost of customer outages. And then we multiply that by the uh, number of customers and the duration that we expect them to be out for a failure of, of any particular cable segment that we might be interested in. And uh, for each cable, we know how likely it is to fail if we know how long it is and how old it is. And we know the customer effects based on, because we know which customers are served by each cable. And so that means we can calculate uh, a risk matrix. And I bet that just about everybody who's listening here has seen one of these at one time or another. We're looking here a real example from uh, from a utility again another one that happens to be in the northwest and what this plots is every cable segment in their system according to how likely it is to fail on the x-axis in other words how many faults do we expect there to be next year in each cable run versus the consequence of failure in terms of the customer effects and so what this uh, what this results in is an estimate that the total risk 
from the cable system is $26 million a year. And of course, it's rising because the probability of failure is increasing. And of that risk, only about $4 million is direct cost, meaning the cost to repair or replace failed cable. The rest of it is customer outage costs. And so hopefully that fits with your intuition that the customer effects are a much bigger deal to you if a cable fails um, than the direct cost to do the repair. Um, so this should bring a question to your mind. You see this and you think, okay, I've got to make decisions about replacing cable. There's an obvious question that should come up, and that question is, so what? I know now what the risk is, but this doesn't tell me anything about what I should do about it. So I know that some cables are higher risk than others, but how do I decide which ones are actually worth replacing or injecting and which ones are not? And so that means we need to go back to our economic life calculation that we looked at at the very beginning. So this is a slightly different form of it. That's looking at the trade-off between capital cost and risk cost, but it's the same basic idea. What we have here, the orange upward sloping curve, is the risk cost of an existing cable run increasing as the cable ages. It's getting more and more likely that it'll fail year by year and cause an outage to the customers. The blue dotted line is the levelized cost of a new cable. So you can kind of think of that like um, a cable mortgage. I'm going to install a new cable and I'm going to just kind of pay the the interest and the maintenance cost going forward and, and um, spread it out over a large number of years so I can flatten it out. And so what I'm interested in is the point where these two curves cross, these two lines cross. So as long as I'm before the point where they cross, that means that the risk of the existing cable is lower than the cost of the new one, and I'm better off to leave it as is. On the other hand, once the curves cross, that means that from that point going forward, the existing asset, the existing cable is going to be more expensive than the new one would be, and I should replace it. So that means the point where those two curves cross, that's the optimal replacement timing for this cable. So if we're looking at one right here, the current age is 20, where the diamond is, and it looks like the optimal replacement timing might be age 30 or 32, this cable would have 12 years of remaining economic life before it should be replaced. We have another option too though, when it comes to underground cable, we don't only have to look at replacement, we could also refurbish it, we could inject it. And the effective injection uh, depends a little bit what your assumptions are about what an injected cable looks like, but for sure what happens is you've, you've uh, rehabilitated it and reduced the probability that it'll fail going forward for at least some number of years. So what we're looking at here on the on the right-hand side is uh, an example of how you might look at the benefits of injection. You can see there that the dotted line, we've taken a notch out of the risk curve going forward. And what that means is that instead of this cable reaching its end of economic life at age 32, like, like, we did, like it did before, now it's going to reach end of economic life at about, it looks like maybe close to age 50 where the dotted line crosses. So we basically bought ourselves another almost 20 years of life by injecting the cable. And so that shaded area there is the risk reduction, the benefit that we get from injecting. And the question is, is that reduction in risk higher or lower than the cost of injecting the cable? If the avoided risk is higher, then uh, that's a good candidate for injection. Uh, our benefits outweigh our costs. And so that, in this way, you can use the same model, the same basic conceptual approach for um, for evaluating various life cycle alternatives, including replacement in kind or upgrade with a new uh, a new standard, say in conduit or injection of the cable, and figure out which option is most cost effective um, for various parts of the system. <clears throat> okay, what you're looking at now is a screenshot of an actual cable evaluation model used by uh, a utility, and I just wanted to show you this to maybe make it seem a little more real that it is actually something you can do. This isn't um, just arm waving. What you're looking at here is an evaluation of a single cable segment. And you can see a graph very similar to the one that we were just looking at here. You see the red risk curve rising over time. You see our leveled replacement cost curve for the new cable segment. And then there's also this blue dotted kind of parabola shape that goes over the top. And what that's calculating is the net benefit of injection year by year. So what we're saying is we could, you know, we have multiple options. We could replace this year, we could inject this year, we could do nothing this year. Or we could replace next year, or we could inject next year, or we could do nothing next year. And so this model is evaluating all of those opportunities 
and identifying which one is the most cost effective. In this case, because the net benefit of injection is positive at the current age, you can see the orange dot and you can see that the parabola, the, the injection benefit little dotted curve up above there is positive. That means that uh, injecting this year is uh, the most cost effective strategy. And so this is the cable that would we would say it's reached uh, the point where uh, it's at it's at its end of life, and the strat the optimal strategy is to inject it. So we go back to our um, our risk matrix, and we're looking now at the same population of underground cables. The blue ones are uh, the cables that are not at end of life, and the red ones are the cables that are at end of life. And so you can see that, as you'd expect, uh, the ones at end of life tend to be concentrated either in cables that are more likely to fail, so they're further to the right on the graph, or in cables that um, have a very high consequence of failure, in other words, the ones that tend to be higher up on the graph. So the further you move up or to the right, the more likely it is that any particular cable is going to be at end of life. But there are surprises. You can see that uh, you know there are bits of blue scattered in there among the red. Uh, in other words, cables that might be uh, lower risk uh, are at end of life even compared to cables that are higher risk. And the, and the reason for that is that it doesn't cost the same to replace every cable. Some cables might be high risk because they're very long. And so <clears throat> the fact that it's long means that it's costly to replace it or costly to inject it. So that means that the benefit cost ratio, the return on investment uh, for that replacement program is not as high as some other cable. So there's some there are some surprises. But if you remember um, when we looked at this risk matrix last time, um, uh, the total risk was about uh, $26 million. And it turns out that uh, about 5% of the population is at end of life uh, in this example. It means that they're currently due for replacement. Now, this the red blob here looks like a lot more than 5% of the cable segments, but uh, that's because this is a logarithmic plot, and so they're really concentrated down at the bottom. You'll have to just take my word for it that that, that really is only 5% of the population. That 5% is uh, completely concentrated in high criticality cables in this in this case. So uh, there was a real strong focus on commercial and industrial customers and on the larger cables that were part of the, uh, the getaways from the substations or the trunk. In other words, places where the consequences of failure would be very high. That's where the, the program was uh, most active. And um, there was virtually no spending on modern cable, only on the older um, HMWPE and XLPE cables where injection is really expected to do um, the most good or replacement is really inspected, expected to provide the most benefit. Okay, so we've evaluated the entire cable program. We know which ones are at end of life now. And we can also know which ones are going to come due for replacement in the future. So this graph is this is from the same analysis. I'm just using this one for all the examples here. But what it shows is a large spike of spending. This is uh, the capital program, a large spike of spending in the first year, followed by a fairly flat program going forward. Um, so these uh, these bars, the dark blue represents the replacement program. The green represents an injection program, and the red is the reactive spending for uh, future failures, uh, for repairs and replacements of future failed cables. This is a, a very typical um, spending program shape where there's a spike up front followed by, like I say, a flatter program going forward. In this case, um, there was about $37 million of near-term spending identified, of which about $7 million is injection and the rest replacement. But of course, because injection is so much less expensive than replacement, um, I forget what the ratio is, probably five to one or, or even higher, um, it actually is uh, more feet of cable that are injected than replaced in this example. Um, that near-term program reduced that the total risk from 28 million, uh, which is what it currently is, to about 4 million, even though this is, I thought, very interesting, even though the failure rate really hasn't changed all that much. So with this graph that just popped up here, the small one, a little hard to read, but what it shows is the pr predicted number of faults going forward, starting this year and looking at next year. So the red, um, the red is if we did nothing and just continue to run the system to failure. And you can see the a steady increase in... Um, 
projected failure rate, and the blue is what happens if we follow this optimal program. So it's a flatter, it's a flatter forward um, projection and failure rates. But you can see right here in the next year, the failure rate doesn't change all that much, much, yet we eliminate almost all the risk from 28 million down to 4 million. And the reason is that we're focusing on those most critical cables where the consequences of failure would be very high. Um, so it turns out that for this example here, the benefit cost ratio of the near term program is about 10 to 1. So it's an extremely cost effective uh, program, one that, that easily passes muster with you know executives or, or regulatory bodies because the benefit to customers is so high compared to the um, cost of the project. Why is there a spike? The reason there's a spike, and like I said before, it's a very common result in these kinds of analyses. Um, uh, the reason is that one of two things. Either the utility has been underspending up until now. They've uh, built up a backlog of uh, work that they should have done, either replacements that they haven't done or, or just delayed work. And so they've got to figure out now how to get caught back up, right? They've, they've built up that backlog. And the other reason there might be a spike is that even if the utility has been proactively replacing or injecting cables, they may not have been identifying the right ones. They may not have been getting the best bang for their buck and so they still have built up a backlog of cables that even though they've you know, been spending a million or two or three million dollars a year uh, in the past replacing cable, they, they, they missed some of the ones that they should have done. So that, that can comprise a spike as well. <clears throat> a lot of you, of course, you know, an actual cable program isn't going to go segment by segment um, and, and scatter over the system. You're going to you're going to combine cables to make sensible. Uh, projects that a contractor can execute. And what this shows here is a, a GIS map of uh, underground cables that are color coded according to whether they're at end of life or not, along with some of the supporting appurtenances like pad mount transformers and uh, some of the other equipment that serves the cable system, switches and elbows and so on, that have different colors according to whether they're at end of, end of life or not. And you can combine them together using a very similar risk-based methodology to ask the question, okay, um, the model tells me that I should go replace the cables in this subdivision immediately, but the pad mount transformers all have 10 or 20 or 30 years to go before they should be replaced. Should I do everything while I'm there, or should I plan on going back and doing the transformers? And what you can see in this example here is as we move to the right-hand graph, when you combine cables and their supporting assets together, they all turn one color. And what that means is that in this example, it was better to do one project and replace everything all at once, even though not everything was necessarily at end of life, in order to save mobilization costs or other, uh, other inconveniences from having two spending projects. I just think this is a good example of how the outputs of, a, of an analysis of a single asset class can be used to support um, a larger program going forward. Okay, most of, most of in most cases, what you'll need to do then is to make a business case to explain either to you know the, the utility needs to explain either to itself or to its regulator why the spending that it wants to do uh, is cost effective, and so that means taking the results of the cable analysis and putting them into some kind of a standardized business case. And uh, usually that, that includes things like a, a summary of the project, a description of what, what work is to be done and, and the cost estimate, and then a qualitative discussion of the benefit. And then there'll be a section on valuation. So what are the, what, what are the reliability effects and the avoided outages that we anticipate from this? What is the benefit cost ratio? What might be the rate impacts? Things like that. And then lastly, a cost of delay. And that's one of the real advantages of a quantitative analysis like this is you can answer the question, what happens if I don't do this work? What, what happens if I ask for the money to do it and you don't give it to me? And you can make a quantitative statement about what the uh, increase in the risk would be associated with that. I want to make a note about data. I mentioned earlier that uh, you, know, you may not have all the data to support the, the full detail of the analysis that I'm describing here. As an asset manager, you, you want your decisions to be as data-driven as you can. It's kind of one of the fundamental tenets of asset management, you know, consistent, repeatable, defensible, data-driven decision-making, or whatever the, whatever the motto is. Um, the point about this cable evaluation approach is that it can make use of whatever data you have. 
So if you've got detailed failure history, an approach like this knows exactly what to do with it. You can make explicit use um, in a very rigorous quantitative way. Uh, you can make use of whatever customer information you may have. So that means the type of customers and what their perceived outage costs are. And it can also make use in a in a quantitative way, whatever subject matter expertise is available at your utility. You can, you could you have a place, a slot to put everything that will immediately affect uh, the final recommended program that comes out of it. But it's not necessarily the case that you're going to have all this. And so I just want to emphasize the point that at each step along the way, there are approximations that you may have to make uh, to make up for the fact that you don't have all the data that you'd want. So I already mentioned some of the things that you might do. You know, you can lean on your subject matter experts to say, listen, we don't necessarily have a good failure history to predict, um, uh, to, to fit a, a, a failure curve for uh, all of our underground cable. What do you believe the failure probability is? Or, or, or what shape do you think this curve should have? And you can use those assumptions on, in the near term until you're able to collect data to support uh, modeling in the future. And you just want to tell yourself, well, I made this assumption based on subject matter expertise, but going forward, I want to collect the data to support uh, a more rigorous analysis. And, and the point is, you know, you're on the hook to make these decisions one way or the other. And so as an asset manager, you have to make do uh, with whatever you have available. You have to do the best you can. Not making a decision isn't one of the options that's available to you. Uh, you, you can't wait around to have perfect data. So what have been the results of this? And I guess the, the real test of an analysis like this is how does it work uh, in front of regulators and executives? So we have quite a bit of experience with this, and I just wanted to highlight a few of them. Um, one of the common applications is really internal use by a utility. Uh, they're trying to ask themselves the question, how much cable should I replace or inject? Or what should my programs be going forward? And they're using an analysis like this for their own internal purposes to plan their programs. And so they're what, who they're trying to convince are their asset managers and their executives and maybe their own internal board. So we've had very good success um, applying this methodology in that context. We've also had um, some specific experience with uh, regulators, particularly in Canada, where the Ontario Energy Board is a very proactive regulator of uh, the electric utilities that they regulate. And uh, one of the clients that we've worked with, Toronto Hydro, developed what they call their feeder investment model, which applies this methodology for all of their asset classes, including underground cable. So the approach has been used in multiple rate, rate cases by Toronto Hydro with the OEB. And the OEB has kind of singled out their FIM, in other words, this methodology for praise as being a very transparent and rigorous way to justify uh, capital spending for aging infrastructure. So uh, based on that, um, we believe that it's, uh, it's, it's a credible approach for use with regulators. We're seeing now many of the other utilities in, based on this because of this result. We're seeing a lot of the other utilities in Ontario who are also regulated by the OEB uh, picking up the methodology for their uses. And of course, they're not all as big as Toronto Hydro and can't afford the level of detail and don't necessarily have the data to support the level of detail that Toronto Hydro can. And so as I mentioned before, they're having to make approximations and assumptions to fill in gaps in their data. And it seems to be working just fine. And then lastly, the, uh, the CPUC, the California Public Utilities Commission, is currently drafting, or maybe they're circulating now, an internal memo to uh, investigate whether they are going to recommend this approach to their subject utilities. So um, they've, they've looked at it and uh, seen enough, enough value in it that uh, they believe it's worth considering. That's the end of my presentation. I, I again, appreciate your time. And uh, I see that some questions have come in, and we will um, try to answer them. <clears throat> Thank you, Darren. Yes, we have received some questions from our audience. And the first one we will ask is, what is your view on testing? So testing fits in pretty well um, in this kind of an analysis. You can you can do a cost benefit evaluation of testing by asking yourself, if I knew this cable was in bad condition, how would that change my um, my decision about whether to replace it or inject it, for example? 
And so uh, you can kind of treat you can kind of treat cable testing as a as an intervention to be evaluated, and 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 treat the the benefit of testing as the information that you get, the reduced uncertainty that you'd have, um, uh, you know, after the test was completed. Um, what we have seen is that a couple of things. One is that testing is is expensive, and so it's not justified necessarily all the way across your system just carte blanche. You wouldn't you wouldn't really test every single cable. But um, there are cases where two things are true, where the cable is very critical and where the results of the test might change your spending plan, where it can be, it can be beneficial. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. What about the initial capital cost to install the now old cable? Okay, that's a really good question. Um, from an economic perspective, the Capital cost to initially install the cable is what's called a sunk cost. So you install the cable in 1972, and now you're trying here in 2016 trying to make a decision about whether to replace it. Well, that initial capital cost is is gone, and there's nothing you can do to get it back. And so uh, it's it's technically not relevant for decision making going forward. So we ignore it. Thank you. And what is the cost of injection compared to new cable? Does it depend at all on insulation wall thickness? Maybe this would be a good one for one of the Novinium people who are listening in to chime in on. Mike, my, my, I can tell you what uh, the utilities that I've worked with have assumed, and that is that, no, they have not assumed that there's going to be a difference in injection costs with wall thickness. And the ratio depended a lot on what their uh, installation practices were, but um, you know, at least five to one, I would say, has been my experience. I heard somebody else come in. Go ahead, Darren. It's Wade here, and yes, uh, mo mostly it's it's somewhere between twenty and forty percent of the cost of replacement, and it's the insulation wall thickness, uh, ten, depending on voltage, uh, cable size. Uh, will mean that the prices are different, but the same as a one art is is a different price than a 500 mcm cable. Uh, the the larger cable has more fluid to inject in it, might take a little longer, but the cost differentials are still substantial. So we generally see anywhere from 20 cents on the dollar to 40 cents on the dollar uh, in terms of replacement cost. Okay, thank you. And uh, our next question, is injection the only way to eliminate partial discharge in cables? I think that's a technical one for for you guys again, Wade. I don't know if you want to weigh in on that. It's not something that I have a uh, I'll give it a shot, uh, not, not being an expert, but uh, uh, depending on the level, if uh, the injection process addresses water trees, and water trees have been shown to create uh, electrical trees and most of the cable failures and when we look at our failure history from injection we've injected millions and millions and millions of feet uh, of cable uh, 200 utilities around the country uh, where the the failure rates are comparable to newly newly replaced cable so uh, what what we've what we see on significant PD though is that uh, there's a there's a line where uh, if it's if it's so significant that it needs to be replaced because uh, the process for rejuvenation just can't address it. Um, so when PD becomes you know electrical trees, uh, we don't recommend uh, rejuvenation. Uh, we generally see about 75% of all cables uh, that we address that are, are able to be injected, and then 25% uh, aren't due to either neutral issues or massive PD, and then we tee them up for uh, replacement. Thank you. And then our next question, can all cables be injected? Do you have to replace elbows and splices? Do you want me to take that one? Uh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I think I'd answer the first part. It, it's, it's a horses for courses. Uh, every utility is different, and every subdivision and every utility is different. Uh, we've experienced every kind of situation there is. Uh, we, if you're interested in us coming and meeting with you and 
uh, introducing you to some other utilities nearby that have that have experienced rejuvenation and and have a chat with them as well uh, will help a lot in terms of understanding uh, what's involved. But uh, we recommend replacing elbows. Uh, there is a way to do a, a process with uh, what we call um, uh, injection uh, adapters. Uh, but as a rule, uh, since we're de which we're de-energizing cables uh, at least partially. To, to do the injection process, uh, we generally recommend uh, replacing the elbows and, and as well as some splices. Uh, we have a process that is a low pressure IUPR process that often flows through splices and uh, we'll do that many instances. Uh, we'll replace the elbows and we'll re-energize the cables and we can inject over-energized cables and through splices and sometimes the splices, depending on the splice type, uh, pin and socket or, or taped or, or something, uh, they're not able to ha be injected through. So at that point, we would recommend uh, digging the splice, re repairing the splice with a brand new splice, and then we can inject through that. Uh, there is a, there's a line um, where, where we would maybe not uh, inject a, a segment with many, many, many splices. Uh, but as a rule, uh, we have many customers that we have a, a very comprehensive program of uh, re repairing uh, splices and uh, reintroducing the cable with new splices, new elbows, and a 20 to 40 year warranty. From a cost benefit perspective, um, my experience has been that the fact that the elbows are replaced has been a real benefit because they can be such a significant source of failures. Just toss that in. Thank you. And our next question, how does injection cost compare to other cable repair methods or identifying PD locations? Wait, I think you might be on again. Okay. Cable repair methods or identify. Uh, so testing for, for for identifying partial discharge, uh, there's there's different ways to do it. And, and when we do our assessments um, and we do our TDR to determine the quality of the cable and, and and its ability to be injected, we do some forms of PD testing. Um, the as a rule, I think I'll throw it back a little bit to Darren. Um, I'm, I'm not an expert in testing per se in terms of costs. I the what I've heard is that the costing for you mostly the PD is offline. That means you have to de-energize and you thump the cable and you put a high bunch over voltage through it and it creates a lot of strain on the cables and it creates its own problems. Injection is a, is a low. Um, it's a, it's it's a lot very it's low inv invasion or inv not very invasive. It uh, doesn't really impact the cables or hurt the cables. And uh, when we're looking at them, we make an assessment of which cables are in really, really bad condition. And the ones that are in bad condition and that have high PD, uh, as a rule, we're not going to inject anyway. Um, the ones, so, so those ones would be left for later replacement or uh, additional testing, what you like. But uh, the, the injection costs are uh, comparable to testing, um, a little bit more, but... The beauty of the injection is you get your 20 to 40 year warranty and you get uh, cable back to near, near new condition. Whereas with testing, uh, you, you, you leave the cable in the same condition you found it and you haven't significantly upgraded it. So Darren, got anything to add to that? Yeah, I would just add that the cases where you do have to take an outage to test, it's a bit, it's a bit hard to make the case that that's worthwhile because what you're trying to avoid is the outage you know you're, the reason you're interested in testing cables is to find the ones that are likely to fail so you're you're taking an outage to avoid an outage which is a, a bit of a difficult case to make so i think it, my my um tentative opinion i guess about testing is that it can be cost effective in certain cases but i don't necessarily see an application for it uh across the board All right, thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Darren, would you like to choose the last one? Well, I don't see what they are, so I'm not going to be able to do that. Okay. I'll ask one more then. Um, 
We have engineers who have strong opinions about cable, when they fail, what to do about it, etc. How do you work with these guys? So this is um, a pretty common situation. Uh, you know, utilities will have experienced people who, uh, you know, based on their experience, will develop strong opinions about what ought to be done uh, with the underground cable. Whether you know, sometimes they'll have opinions that you should never inject it, or that it all must be replaced and brought up to uh, current standards, installed in conduit, or, or whatever it is. And uh, one of the real benefits that we've seen of using the economic life approach that we just talked about is that it kind of brings them inside the, the tent a little bit um, because you're leaning so heavily on subject matter expertise in order to define what the input assumptions are going to be, the failure rates and the consequences of failure and so forth, that you get a chance for those people to be heard but not necessarily to drive what the final program is going to be. So you're, you're, you're asking them for their subjective expertise in areas where they really are experts, like what happens when a cable fails or what's the difference between um, a cable that's installed in conduit or direct buried or uh, what are the effects of degraded neutral. That is where their expertise is strong. And you're not leaning on them in areas where their expertise may not be as strong, such as how much money should we spend um, injecting uh, underground cable next year. And that's, that, that isn't, I don't mean this is a slam on them in any way, but that's beyond their expertise. It's not something that by virtue of their job that they're necessarily in a position to address. So uh, I guess I would say that um, one of the real benefits of this approach is it kind of gets everybody to put their cards out on the table and, uh, and it really helps to, um, to keep everybody on side. All right, thank you so much, Darren. Um, for anyone with questions still unanswered, we will be able to get in touch with you one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, Darren, we thank you for taking the time to speak with us today, and thanks to everyone for joining us. We hope you enjoyed the webinar and look forward to our next Masters of Reliability webinar with Tom Brule of St. Charles Municipal Electric Utility on February 24th. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.